Uh, Tim Cook uh, sat down with our own Susan Lee uh, talking about the coronavirus and saying, I guess that, look, it's a passing thing. It's not a long term thing. That was the gist the, of it. The demand is there. People yeah. want to buy the iPhones and the Apple services, but because of factories being closed, stores being shut, they can't get access to them. Wow. So the demand is there. It will come back, he says. And I think most economists believe that, that the consumption will return once this passes. But we had exclusive access with Tim Cook in Birmingham, Alabama, a, ho a homecoming of sorts for a local hero. You know, he, he grew up in Alabama, right. went to Auburn, and now he's pushing these new philanthropic educational these initiatives at Apple in basically providing coding opportunities for the underrepresented. Now, we had a, a chat with him and we talked all things about Apple, stock market, coronavirus, and yes, even his relationship with President Trump. Listen. Things are going uh, pretty much like we thought they would go there in terms of bringing things back. And uh, so it'll, it will take some time. Mm -hmm. but, but by and large, I think this is a temporary condition. Uh, not not a long term kind of thing. You know, Apple is fundamentally strong, and and uh, that's so th that's how I see it. Do you anticipate disruptions to last past the second quarter? Well, there, our second quarter is a quarter we're in. Just to, to be clear with our investors, right, is the March quarter, uh, your calendar first quarter. And so I don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, we're still in February, and, you know, there's, uh, there's reason for optimism, but, but we'll see. You know, the, um, I, I think the, the focus in the last few days have turned off of China on to Korea and Italy. And so I think it's very important to see what happens there and whether uh, something new comes out of that. Uh, our supply chain is, is relatively uh, uh, more important in, in China, uh, but, uh, but we have great businesses in Korea and we have suppliers in Korea as well and suppliers in Italy and a great business there as well. So we, we need to see as that unfolds. Well, the stock market obviously is reacting and Apple has been down in yeah. the uh, past few weeks. For someone that creates value inside America's largest company, do you think there's value that investors are missing? Well, my, my perspective, I don't, first of all, I don't really focus on the short-term gyrations of the market. I, I think uh, for me uh, and with the way we run the company, we work for the long term. And I see no long-term difference between uh, what was happening four weeks ago versus what's happening today. And so uh, now the market takes time to recognize that and, and so forth, and it'll do what it's going to do. And I'm the last person to be able to predict it. But I, I would, you know, for me, I look through that, look through the noise and, and concentrate on the future. And the future looks very bright. You might be able to get Apple at a discount, at a 15 percent discount. Well, we are a buyer, right? You know, we have a share repurchase plan. And uh, so, yes. This might be an opportunity to maybe up those share repurchases for Apple. I, won't, I don't want to announce anything on, <laughs> on the air, but, but uh, we, everybody knows that we're buying, we're buying shares. And, and if the stock is lower, you buy more shares for the same amount of money. So. Now, you're the architect of this low inventory, fast moving supply chain that Apple currently has. Do you have any, I guess, ideas to maybe bring back or move some of that supply chain outside of China more? Well, it is important to recognize that, that our products are built everywhere. I mean, they are truly global products. And so you have um, several parts that are made in the United States that serve the world. Mm -hmm. So not only for the iPhones sold in the uh, U United States, but those sold around the world. And so what will happen to the supply chain as we look back on this? I, I wouldn't want to say at this point, because the, qu the question for us always is what kind of resilience did the supply chain have? It's not, was there a problem? Because there, there will always be unpredictable things that come up. But as you know from following us, we've worked through earthquakes, tornadoes, fires, floods, uh, tsunamis, uh, SARS. And so we've had a long list of things, and the, the operational team is very deep at working through these. Mm -hmm. And so the question for us after we get on the other side will be, 
was the resilience there or not, and do we need to make some changes? Uh, my perspective sitting here today uh, is that if there are changes, you're talking about uh, adjusting some knobs, not some sort of wholesale fundamental change. Mm -hmm. So you don't anticipate then moving, say, to other low-cost countries like the Vietnams or the Cambodias? Because some people have called this an inflection point mm -hmm. for China's manufacturing industry, especially with the disruptions that have been caused. And people are uncertain at this point because China's not cheap anymore, let's be honest, mm -hmm. right? I, you know, uh, yeah, that's the, the thing that people don't understand, I think, is that, that there's a perspective that, that uh, is that China is, but it's, it hasn't been for a long time, as both of us know, and and so. But for us, we're not we're not really fixated on cost only. Cost is one factor, clearly, but we're also focused. We're fixated on quality, mm -hmm. and we're, we're focused on time to market and the speed and the depth of engineering in the in the different places. And so, somebody would have to meet all of those in order for us to, to do something. Yeah. And announcing also your first retail store in India by the year 2021. Yeah. I'm excited about that because I see India as a huge uh, opportunity for us. For years, we could not enter there unless we entered there with a partner in re into retail, and we did not want to do that. You know, We want to maintain control over our brand and, and, and so forth. Uh, but. Uh, the administration worked on this with the uh, Indian government, and that change has been made. And so we're, we are very, very positive about entering in there on online this year and retail next year. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of uh, the administration, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but when people see Tim Cook on one side, Donald Trump on the other, they see a lot of difference. But you have been able to engage and work together so how does this, the relationship work? Well, there, there are differences. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but you look for intersections. And uh, I care a lot about creating jobs. And I think the president does as well. I care a lot about training the workforce for the future. And the administration is really focused on this as well. I think one of the U.S.'s major challenges is to solve this issue. It's that as technology speeds over and over again and jobs are disrupted and jobs are created, we have to make sure our education is preparing people for the disruption and the creation. And I think if we do that, we can, we can flourish in this environment. But if we don't, we leave a lot of people behind. And, and that should be unacceptable for all of us. And so uh, these are just two of the things that, where there's intersections. And I think, I think most people would say those are nonpartisan. You know, the creation of jobs should be nonpartisan. The, the uh, education should be nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that's how I see it. You know, we're very focused on policy, not politics. That probably helps. Um, I, I think we don't have a pack. You know, we're probably the most non-political company out there. Uh, we don't give to uh, political campaigns, you know, ca candidate campaigns, and, and so forth. But we do focus on policy because we want to be a contributing uh, citizen of the United States and, and to help the country every way we can. Mm -hmm. Now, some would say that you were probably one of the first, if not the first, in Silicon Valley to reach out and engage with the White House. Recently, Larry Ellison of Oracle held a fundraiser for President Trump, receiving a lot of backlash from his employees. Have you received any sort of criticism for trying to engage and work with the White House from your employees? Well, we have a large employee base, and, and people are welcome to have the views that they have. But I try to uh, do what I say and say what I do, right? And, and my perspective is engagement is always best. Because just simply standing on the sideline and yelling doesn't accomplish anything but, but polarization. And, and so I, I want to suit up and play a role. And uh, if I disagree on something, I want to try to influence it. If I agree on something, I want to try to amplify and figure out a way that I can help in some way and be a great citizen of the country. Uh, so that, that is my, my perspective on things and the way, that, the way that we try to lead the company. Tim, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. being here. So neutral.
so I would say sober figure at yeah. the head of America's largest company. And the sense I got was that there wasn't a lot of panic when it comes to coronavirus and what's happening in China. As he said in that interview, some suppliers and factories have been reopening. In fact, they had to shut all 42 stores during the worst of the coronavirus in right. China. But uh, now more than 30 have reopened, some with limited hours. And we've been here before. You know, Tim Cook has been CEO of Apple since 2011. He's seen a lot of this Absolutely. ups and downs. But uh, as you see with the stock trade, you know, above record highs or were at record highs earlier this year, he's been able to expand that value despite the fact that you do have slowing phone sales.